during uh, my time uh, serving at uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church in Lawrence. And uh, that is where I met Brother Stone. I met Brother Stone because he came to ask me some questions. And uh, he was on my ordination council. And uh, he knew uh, the pastor uh, where I was serving as youth pastor, Brother Don Mitchell. And uh, it's the first time that I had ever met him. And uh, uh, I don't know if he under knew or not, but uh, ordination service is a time of terror for uh, young men. Because you just never know what you're going to get. And I had been at camp with uh, the one that was our chairman, uh, Brother uh, Frank Wood. And that I scared to death of Frank Wood, and uh, and I thought, oh Lord, I'm I'm going to be in trouble. And uh, but you know what? It was good. The, the men asked proper questions, wanted to make sure, and uh, properly examined me. And praise the Lord, and uh, I was able to be ordained. And uh, I've served here in this area now, going on 28 years. And uh, so Amen. we've uh, been here, uh, enjoyed uh, my time of service, and uh, uh, I met a brother um, uh, Manny. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I uh, had a prayer meeting that we had at our church and uh, uh, discovered a whole bunch of people that I hadn't seen in a while. And uh, um, and uh, so it was good to get a chance to meet them. And Brother Stone invited me then and uh, to come sometime and preach. He called me back to remind me and of uh, that. And uh, we settled on this date. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, of you good folks allowing me to be here. In Amen. Romans chapter number 10, we're going to use this as a starting point for what I want to speak to you, you this morning. And, and Brother uh, uh, Manny in Sunday School did a great job in, uh, in teaching us. And uh, the title of the message this morning is this, It Just Took Faith. It Just Amen. Took Faith. Now, if you would, follow along. I'm going to start reading in verses 1 through 4, then I'm going to drop down to verse number 9. It says this, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. It's the Apostle Paul. He is writing, and his heart's desire is to see his fellow countrymen be saved. Amen. Our heart's desire as a church, as a church family, and I include myself, say, well, you're not a member of this church. We're still all part of the church. We're still part of the family of God as we are saved. Is that is that you should be saying is that Noblesville would be saved. Amen. Greenfield would be saved. Indiana would be saved. Amen. The United States would be saved. And, uh, and, you know, we look at people and problems and things that go on, and really the answer for everything that's there is Jesus. It's just Jesus. If Jesus could get into the hearts of these people, and, and Paul understood that. He loved his fellow Jews. He loved his countrymen. And his honest desire, the reason he was doing everything that he could to reach them, and they were the biggest rejectors of him. These people beat him. And still, his heart, what, what did he say? He says, my, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that he might be saved. But he understood something. Look at verse number four. It says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not willing, uh, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for, the righteous, uh, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And skip down to verse number 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all of, of all that call upon him. Amen. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All of us have an equal opportunity in salvation. Let's pray. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time that we can gather this morning. I pray, God, that you would just uh, remove everything out of our minds and our hearts, Lord, except for your word. I pray, God, that for the next few minutes that we would focus upon your word, Lord, and that we would listen, Lord, to what you're telling us, Lord, about faith. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, in the passage that we just read, according uh, uh, that we read, the Apostle Paul was writing and expressing his personal desire 
that his fellow Israelites would get saved. What his prayer for them was this. He just wanted them to stop being religious. Amen. There are a lot of people this morning that got up, got dressed, and have walked through the door of a church fulfilling their religious duty. They, they, they're, they're, they're checking it off for the day. There are even some Bible-believing Christians that check off their devotions for the day. And uh, they, check out, they, they have boxes that they want to check. They're just, they're religious. As long as I have these boxes checked, I feel better or I feel good about myself. And the Jews were that way. They felt good about themselves. He, he, but he was praying that they would stop just being religious, but they would come to a true knowledge of who God is and what he did for them through his son, Jesus Christ. And he never stopped preaching to them. If you ever notice, when Paul would go into a town on each one of his missionary journeys, he went to the synagogue first. He went to his men first, and when they rejected, then he would preach to the Gentiles. And he found more acceptance there. Amen. But Paul knew that his fellow, fellow countrymen were very religious. All of us know people that are very religious. If you grew up in a Hispanic community, you know there are a lot of people that are very, very religious. Amen. They're very religious. They know what jewelry to wear. They know what to say, and all of that. But see, these people, they were just following the laws of Moses. And they were dependent upon their own obedience to it, to the law, to fulfill their righteousness or to be righteous before a holy God. They forgot what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 64 verse 6, which is this. But we are all as an unclean thing, for all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Things that we would throw away, that's, that's what our righteousness is compared to as a filthy rag. And we do fade away as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Paul knew that just pure, plain religion would not save them. They weren't going to be saved by following the law. They needed to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not about religion. It's all about relationship. It's about a relationship that we have. <clears throat> and uh, he knew that it was only by placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ could they be saved. But salvation is not just for Jewish people only. He said this, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what keeps most people who hear the gospel from being saved? What is it? It's a lack of faith. It's a lack of faith. It's a lack of trust. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Those two words found in verses uh, 9 and 10, believe and believeth, mean exactly this. They mean to have faith in. To have faith in. This morning I want to take a couple, uh, I want to look at, at three different people found in the book of Luke that came to uh, uh, believe uh, in God through faith. If you would, please uh, turn to uh, Luke chapter number 7. Please turn to Luke chapter number 7. In Luke chapter number 7, we have uh, Jesus. He has just completed uh, uh, preaching uh, his uh, famed Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, and uh, we pick up here in verse number 1 says this. It says, Now when... Uh, he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people. He, re, he, re, he entered into Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is a city on the north uh, side of the Sea of, of Galilee. And uh, uh, it was, seems that Capernaum, this fishing uh, village, uh, uh, was Jesus' primary resting place during his, during his Galilean ministry. In Matthew chapter number 9, verse 1, it even says they even called Capernaum uh, his own city. Since Jesus had no home of his own, according to Luke chapter 9, verse 58, uh, it must have, he must have stayed with one of the disciples that was, was from that area. Perhaps he stayed with Peter, or he stayed with Andrew, or he stayed with uh, John, or uh, maybe even Matthew, James. Or maybe he stayed with Peter's wife's family, who were all uh, from this area, who were all from Capernaum. But Capernaum wasn't just a fishing village. Capernaum was a, a border town with a custom station for merchants traveling to and from Syria. It was a, it was a it was a byway 
uh, that. Uh, here, Capernaum uh, was, uh, was a major trade route, and, uh, and it was also known as the way of the sea, this trade route, the way of the sea. And so people who were going from, from Egypt up to Arabia and people coming across would, would come through there. So there are many diverse groups and things for Jesus to preach to. Uh, Jesus never did anything by mistake, but he was there. Capernaum was one of the main places that he preached. And so the Bible says that he entered into Capernaum. Then I want you to look at verse number two. It says this, And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching them that he would come and heal his servant. Let's just stop right there. Now, there was a concerned Gentile. This was someone who uh, was non-Jewish. Now, a Roman centurion was a military officer who was in charge of 100, uh, a 100-man 100 platoon. And so he had uh, these men that were stationed there in, in this area since it was a major crossroads and things. This man had been there. Now, the Romans were an oppressive, occupying force uh, in Israel who were not afraid to use brute force if they had to. Okay? If you were to study uh, uh, history, you, you would note that. And uh, they were the, the occupying power of the time. And I am sure that the crowds that uh, followed Jesus in and out of the, with the crowds that followed Jesus in and out of the area, this captain or this centurion understood who Jesus was. Because uh, uh, people came. I mean, we, we know that, that Jesus had crowds of up to uh, 10,000 plus people that would come. We know that he fed 5,000 plus women and children. So it could have been more than that. So all of these throngs of crowds. And here was this centurion with a hundred man platoon. Now that's, that would be kind of hard to mount something against all those people. So I'm sure they kept an eye on who Jesus was. They kept an eye and they listened to see what type of message that he was spreading. And I'm sure that, uh, uh, that he was well aware of who Jesus was. And we know he was uh, because of what it says in verse number 3. It says that when he had heard of Jesus... So that meant that he was listening. That meant that he was watching. And we know that, uh, that, that there was a concern. It says, when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching them that they would come and heal his servant. Now we see that he was a, a, a man who cared for those that worked for him. He had a servant. Hey, servants in this area were a dime a dozen. But there was something about this servant that was dear to this man. He knew that he was at a point of death. I'm sure that he had done everything that he could. The best uh, uh, medics that they had in his platoon or the best doctors that they could get in the area couldn't do anything for this man. And there, for some reason there was something about this servant that, uh, that he wanted to see him uh, to, to be healed. And so as, uh, uh, as a resort, he, he had listened and he had heard the things that Jesus had done. So he wanted Jesus to come and to heal uh, his servant. We see that he had a good relationship with the elders of the town. Because it says that he beseeched uh, the elders of the Jews. Now he had a good relationship in the town. The elders went to go speak on his behalf. Now this was an occupying general. This was, this was somebody uh, who should have been their enemy. But instead, this man uh, had, had treated the people in the area nice. Uh, he saw the elders, the elders saw him as a friend and not an enemy. Look at verses 4 and 5. It says, And when they came to Jesus, who was the, they? The they are these, these elders. And they bes besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built to us a synagogue. Now, the elders spoke on his behalf and uh, uh, in that. Now, he showed his love for the people of Israel. He built them a synagogue. I had the privilege of getting to go to Israel. I got to go to uh, Capernaum. I remember uh, from, from, uh, from down in the town of, si uh, of Tiberias, on the southern end of the uh, Sea of Galilee, taking a boat ride all the way up to uh, Capernaum and seeing all uh, that is there. And uh, I used to think the Sea of Galilee, man, it must have been ginormous. It's a giant lake. It's a giant lake. You could see it from north to south, east to west. And, uh, 
But still, this is where Jesus was. That's right. And I remember taking that boat ride up there. And I remember uh, after we got there, uh, going to this glass cathedral that sat there. And uh, someone said, do you have your Bible with you? And I said, I have mine. We were in a tour group. So we want you to read Matthew chapter uh, uh, 5, 6, and 7 for us. So I got a chance to read the Sermon on the Mount, standing there looking at all the things that Jesus saw as he preached. It was a wonderful time uh, to, to get to do that. Now, when we went into Capernaum, and the little gate thing there says, the city of Jesus, we got to go see this very synagogue. The ruins of the synagogue show uh, are still there. It was a beautiful structure made of white limestone, and it showed uh, by, the ac uh, by the architectural features that it was built in the time of the Herods. It was the very synagogue that was there, and it was hard to uh, Peter's uh, uh, mother-in-law's house. And, uh, and, but there was little doubt that the centurion uh, who had erected this uh, wanted to uh, uh, show uh, his concern, his care for the people. He wanted them to be able to worship freely. And, uh, uh, but they, and, and these people saw him as a friend instead of a foe. So they came on his behalf to Jesus. And we'll see why. Why didn't he come himself? We'll see that here in just a minute. But... In return, we didn't just see a concerned Gentile in, in this uh, thing. We also see a caring Savior, Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 6. It says, And when Jesus, uh, and Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, trouble not yourself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wait a minute. This guy is the officer in charge. This guy is, is somebody that other people look up to. But when Jesus came, when, when he saw the throng of people coming, and he knew that Jesus was on his way, he sent people out to stop him and says, says, Please, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come into my house. He had respect for this preacher. It wasn't such some country bumpkin preacher that was out there on the seashore preaching. He understood that this was somebody who had authority with God. Amen. And uh, he had faith. He had faith. Look at, look, look at what he said. He says, Wherefore, verse number 7, Neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. He understood that Jesus had something to do with a holy God, a powerful God. He had heard perhaps some of the messages. He had heard or maybe even seen some of the people that had gotten healed. He understood that when he stood before Jesus, he was standing before God. You see that there. You see that there. Jesus had received the elders and immediately went with their request. He had a concern. He respected the centurion's request. The captain recognized his sinful condition. It says, please stay away. The captain understood that, uh, that uh, what it meant to be a man in authority. Listen to what he said. He says, Wherefore, neither thought myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant will be healed. Think about that. This man was practicing what? Faith. Faith in who? In the doctors? In the religious people? In the elders? No. He said, Jesus, if you'll say the word, what's going to happen? My servant will be healed. He had the faith. He had the faith. Why? Because he understood somebody who had authority. I believe that the centurion showed a great deal of, of, of humility in showing uh, uh, that he uh, had come to uh, believe Jesus more than, more than just being a prophet or some type of magician. He understood that Jesus was a very man of authority and he knew that Jesus could speak the word and his servant would be healed. Look at verses 9 and 10. Um, look, at, uh, look at verse number 8 first, I'm sorry. It says, For I am a man set under authority, having me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do, and he doeth. He said, hey, if you'll just say the word, I understand you have the authority. I understand that you have the power to do so. So what does Jesus say in verse number 9? And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him 
And he turned him about and said to the people that followed him, saying, I say unto you, listen to what it says, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. There was this Gentile. There was this person. He wasn't, this, this battle-hardened soldier wasn't brought under the, up under the teachings of the Jews. We don't know that he went to Sunday school anywhere or Sabbath school anywhere. He had been with a bunch of people that and, uh, and, and, and worked for a bunch of people that were, were wanted to be worshipped. They were man worshippers. They were idol worshippers. But he had listened enough. He had watched enough. And he understood that Jesus had the authority and that Jesus had the power to do what? To heal his servant. And what did Jesus call his belief? He called it faith. He called it faith. What is faith? Faith is moral conviction. It is reliance upon Christ for uh, salvation. He knew that the only way this man could be saved was for Jesus to speak the word. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 13, it, the, the same story recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, it says that Jesus said unto the, the centurion, Go thy way as, as thou hast believed, be it unto thee. He says, because of your belief, your servant's going to be healed. Amen. Because of the faith that you have, good things are going to happen. It was because of his faith. It was because of his faith. He freely chose to believe that Jesus was whom he claimed to be. And it was through that faith and trust in Jesus and his, uh, that he and his family's lives were changed forever. Because what happened? What happened? Look at verse number 10. It says, and, and, they, and they that were sent returned to the house and found the servant what? Whole. He wasn't just getting better. He wasn't on the mend. He was whole. Amen. He was whole. Aren't you glad that when we get saved, He takes away all of our sin? Amen. We're not healing from sin. We're forgiven. Amen. We're forgiven. We're forgiven, man. This is something that he was whole that had been made sick. It was a Gentile. A Gentile. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Amen. There's no different. You'd say, well, it, it's impossible for some people to get saved. Nope. The lost of the lost of the lost can still get saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall, shall be saved. Shall be saved. Uh, look over in, in uh, Luke chapter number 8, starting in verse number 40. We'll see the faith of some Jews. That was the faith of the Gentiles and the faith of Jews. I love this story. I, I love this passage of Scripture. And it says this, And it came to pass when Jesus uh, was returned, the people gladly received Him, for they were all waiting for Him. Where? Capernaum. He had come back home. People were waiting. People couldn't wait for him to uh, to get there. Jesus had returned to the city of Capernaum and found the crowd waiting. But as he came in, in verse number 41, we see that he finds a despondent father. It says, Behold, as Jesus is coming into the city, and behold, there was there came a man named Jairus, who was a uh, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he should come to his house for he had only one daughter about 12 years of age and she lie a dying but as he went the people thronged him we see a despondent father he is described for us he is a ruler of the synagogue now the synagogue was a local place of worship we know that hey in Capernaum who built the synagogue it was the Roman centurion and so this man here that was in the synagogue. This ruler, a ruler of the synagogue, was responsible for the administration of the synagogue, for the building maintenance, for the worship supervision. It uh, may uh, have been quite unusual. Uh, it would have been very quite unusual for somebody who was a ruler in the synagogue, somebody who was looked up to, somebody who was uh, religiously revered, to come and to fall at the feet of a traveling preacher and ask him to heal his daughter. Hey, it took him. It took a lot of pride, uh, or it took him to humble his pride to come 
before all the people that were there and to see him fall on at his feet at Jesus Amen. at Jesus feet right. he came and he humbled himself before the Lord and the multitude of others you know what keeps so many people out of heaven they won't humble themselves right. they won't humble themselves if you come to, to Jesus you need to humble yourself it says now I'm curious about something let me ask you a question do you suppose that this ruler could have been one of the Jewish officials that had gone to Jesus to make that appeal? That's good. I mean, after all, if he's the ruler of the synagogue and he's one of the ones that uh, uh, were taking care of that and, and, and knew firsthand of this centurion, hey, maybe so. Amen. Maybe he was one of those that had come. After all, the centurion had built that synagogue. Now, he was wanting Jesus to come what? Immediately. He says, you need to come right now. Why? Because his, his child was sick. I remember being at a, at a church dinner with our, when our uh, little girl was two years old, her oldest daughter. And she pulled over a crock pot of chili at the, at the church dinner over and she received second and third degree burns on her legs. I remember rushing her to the hospital dressed like a hobo. And uh, we were having a hobo dinner. We were dressed apart, everything. I remember rushing, rushing to the hospital to take my little girl. I wanted the doctors to do something. It wasn't that we were praying, but we were trying our very best to do everything we could in our power to, to take care of her. And, I, and you, can, you can understand as a father in here, those of you who, who have children, what it's like when one of them gets sick, especially when it's, it's, it could be something unto death. And uh, I've never had to go through that. That was probably the worst thing I've ever had to go through. Is, uh, it was that with one of my kids but here uh, you, you can understand how the father was and he was he wanted Jesus to come immediately but here we see in verse 42 it says it, it tells us a little bit it says but as he but as he went as Jesus went the people thronged him they were crowded around him everybody wanted something everybody wanted something Jarius just knew if I could get Jesus to her my daughter will be will be healed if I could just get her, if I could just get Jesus to her. He needed to have that, that physical presence. But something takes place. We see the second person we're going to talk about. Look at verse 43. So here people are thronging Jesus. And then there's a story within the story. It says this, verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. But she came behind him, and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood was staunched, or it was <coughs> stopped. This woman had a problem. She was desperate. This woman tried everything to be healed. She had spent all that she had on what the world had to offer, but the world couldn't give her what she needed. And she knew if I could just get close enough to Jesus to touch his garment, some people say the hem of his garment, just to touch him. If I could just just touch him, I know I could be healed. She was trying to do, uh, uh, this woman was willing to do whatever she could to get to the Lord. Because of her condition, she was considered ceremoniously unclean. She could not only go to the temple, but she wasn't supposed to be around people. She didn't care. She didn't care what people thought. She didn't care. She was going to get to Jesus because she knew only she could be healed by him she came believing uh, only Jesus could help her in Matthew chapter 9 verse 21 it says for she said within herself if I may but touch his garment I shall be whole she understood that the power was in Jesus she understood that uh, that she had faith that Jesus could heal her without even saying anything. She said, if I could just get there, I know that he has the answer for me. Can I tell you this morning, Jesus has the answer. Amen. So many times we're so busy looking all around us for answers somewhere else when Jesus just has it. If we could just get to Jesus. Uh, the Collingsworth family is a family that sings, sings a song. I've got to get to Jesus about this woman. I've, just, I've got to get to Jesus. You know, a lot of times we just need to understand, hey, we need to get to Jesus. Amen. So many times we, we think, well, you know, that's for somebody who's really desperate. And that, and I'm not talking, I think I'm talking to a room full of believers here. 
a lot of times we have a hard time having this type of faith. We try everything else and we see a delivering Savior. Look at verse number 45. It says, And Jesus said, Who touched me? And all denied, and Peter and they uh, that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee. And thou sayest, Who touched me? Hey, do you understand what it's like to be in a crowd, don't you? I mean, well, when, you're, when you're in a big crowd, people are touching you. You don't believe me? Go to New York City, get on a subway <laughs> during rush hour. Washington. I remember I was down in Virginia Beach when my uh, parents had lived there. And uh, uh, I was down with uh, some of my friends. And uh, we were walking along the boardwalk. And here came a, just a multitude of people coming down the, the street. And they were even pouring out into the street. There's just so many people. I'm thinking, I wonder what's going on. So we just kind of stood there. And Muhammad Ali <laughs> was coming down the street. And everybody was trying to, to, to just touch him. They just just wanted to touch him, and his people are trying to keep keep him away, and he's he's waving at people and, and and things, and you know if you could just touch his hand, you know watch when somebody important comes by. What do people want? They just want to touch him. Just want to touch him. And so here this is going on, and now I believe there are people touching Jesus, but Jesus stopped and noticed something different about this woman touching him. Amen. There was a difference. There was a difference. Look with me. <clears throat> Verse number 46. It says, And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. <clears throat> Jesus understood that somebody touched him believing. He understood that somebody touched me. Did I, do, I, do, you think I, do you think that Jesus really didn't know who it was? Of course he did. Oh, Jesus, yeah. Jesus knew who it was. <laughs> but he wanted to give her a chance. Right. He wanted to give her a chance. To testify, look at verse forty-seven. How do we know that? And when the woman saw that she could not, that she was not hid, because I'm sure it was probably like this: Who touched me? <laughs> Who touched me? You know, I used to have a teacher, Mr. Shelby, in fifth grade. There's somebody in this room talking. I'm not going to give you their name, but I'll just give you their initials, Rick Salazar. <laughs> You're like, that's busted. You know, busted. And so here, this woman was. And, uh, but go to verse 47. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. And she declared unto him, listen to this, before all the people what, for what cause she had touched him. And how she was uh, healed, what? Immediately. Amen. Immediately. Immediately. And listen to this, verse 48. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Read it with me. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Amen. Go in peace. I have found not so great faith in Israel for the Gentile, for this poor Jewish woman who needed the touch of Jesus. What was it, what was it that healed her? It was her faith. It was her faith. She placed her faith in Jesus. And Jesus said, because of your faith, I'm sure there were other people that probably said, well, maybe he can do something for me. But they weren't coming in faith. That's right. They weren't coming in faith. Look at verse 49. I haven't forgotten about Jairus. Remember, Jairus is watching all of this stuff take place. It says, And while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Could you just imagine how he must have just sunk? How it must have just broke his heart that this little girl, his little girl, was gone. There's no way these people would have come and, and, and told him this unless this little girl had no breath left in her, no heartbeat. But they come. And you can imagine what it must have been like for Jarius to hear that news at that time. But aren't you glad for the compassionate Savior? Look at verse number 50. It says that when they heard of it, 
he, he answered him, this is Jesus, when Jesus heard of it, he answered him saying, fear not, believe only. Then what do we see? We see a conjunction, don't we? And what does that conjunction tell us? And she shall be made whole. What was her healing contingent upon? The Father's belief. The Father's belief. Now think about it. More than likely, I have no doubt, he knew about Jairus, his servant, being healed. I mean, about um, the Roman centurion servant being healed. He had just watched a woman come to Jesus, explain why she came. She was touched, and Jesus said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Correct. Jarius is watching all of this, and now <laughs> Jesus is turning to him and asking him, asking him, Do you have that same belief? Because that word belief there is what I said, is, is defined just the way it is to have faith in. Do you have faith in me? Do you have faith? Look at verse 51. And when he was coming to the house, he suffered no man to go in save Peter and James and John and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. And, she, and he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And listen to the reaction of the world. Listen to the action of the crowd. One thing you have to understand about uh, Jews and, and, and funerals and stuff, they had professional paid mourners. Yeah. They had people that would come and cry and be well. Now, I, I remember when my, when my grandfather died, Aldolfo Salazar, I remember when he, when he passed away. Uh, my, my dad was just torn to pieces. And I remember driving from Colorado Springs down to Pueblo and walking into my grandma's house. And hearing my grandma from a back bedroom as I'm coming through the door, a back bedroom of the house when my dad went to go see her and they met for the first time since my, they found my grandfather out in his rose garden. And I've never heard such a screech and a bewilderment in my entire life of someone whose heart was broken. I think much like that, that's what they were hearing as they were coming up to the house. You think about Jarius. He's walking and he's, and, he, and he's thinking, Jesus did it for the centurion. Jesus healed this woman. He can heal my daughter. Amen. He can heal my daughter. I know he can heal my daughter. And as he comes and he meets his wife for the first time, eye to eye, and she's looking at him, and, and, and they're crying together because they're little, and he's going, I'm trying to have that belief. I'm trying to have that faith. Then you have all of these people. As Jesus says, hey, She's only asleep. We'll be out in just a little bit. Ha 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 ha! No, what a joke! What a joke! They laughed him to scorn. It wasn't nice. They weren't nice about it. Hey, these were people that were from this area. They had seen the miracles that Jesus could do. You know what? Despite. What all the world sees and the miracles and the things that Jesus does, people still to this day laugh him to scorn. And so here Jairus was under this pressure. The crowd that uh, uh, was praising God as, as they're coming towards Jairus' house, they hear the mourning, and I'm sure people kind of got a little bit quiet. Then all of a sudden they hear people laughing at Jesus from inside. And it says, and Jesus sent them out. And so you have this crowd praying, expecting a miracle, and you have these people coming out, uh, making fun and jeering Jesus. But Jesus goes in, look with me if you would please, and says, and they laughed him to scorn, verse 53, knowing that she was dead. Hey, they saw. They saw. They saw that this little girl was physically dead. And he put them all out, and he took her by the hand, and called, saying, Made arise. What was Jesus doing? He was calling her spirit back. I have no doubt that her spirit had departed from her. She was dead. She was physically dead. But Jesus said, come back. Come back. Hey, who put Lazarus' spirit back in him? 
says, Lazarus, come forth. Why did he say his name? Because if you would have just said, come forth, what do you think would have happened? He said, Maid, arise. Maid, arise. He called her and brought her back. Jerry's had a decision to make when Jesus asked him, belief or unbelief? Belief or unbelief? And his choice was tested. But you know what? Jesus made her whole. Why? Because her dad believed. Because her dad believed. It wasn't contention upon mom. It wasn't contention upon the disciples. It was contingent upon his individual belief. He's the one that asked. He's the one that prayed. As Jesus promised, the little girl was made whole. Look at verses 55 and 56. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. You know what that word means? They were amazed. They were just simply amazed. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. They didn't have to say anything. That crowd that just walked out the door, that said she was dead, all of a sudden the little girl goes, can I go out and play? I see Mary and Martha out there. Can I go out and play with them now? Well, you got to eat lunch first. Okay, but after I eat lunch, can I go outside and play? Can you imagine those people that laughed Jesus to scorn? Yeah. They think I know. Yeah. Jesus wasn't out there going. Nope. <laughs> he said, don't, don't say anything. And Jesus went, went on his way. He didn't need to. Why? Because there was a Roman centurion servant walking around Capernaum. That was dead. Or nigh unto death. There was a woman with an issue of blood. That had been healed. And now there was a little girl. One of, the, one of the ones that Jesus brought back from the dead walking around. Why? It just took faith. It just took faith. Let me end with this story. In a farming community, it hadn't rained for a long time and things were getting desperate. The ministers decided they were going to call a prayer meeting. They said, look, we want the whole town to come out to the prayer meeting and bring all of your religious symbols with you. So the whole town showed up in the town square for the prayer meeting. The people brought their crosses, they brought their Bibles, they brought their, um, uh, their, their prayer beads, whatever they had, they, they brought it with them. And they cried out to God. And when they had finished praying, there was no rain in sight. And they all went home. But the very next day, in the town square where they had the prayer meeting, there was a little boy. And he showed up and he prayed thus, Oh God, we need rain. God, please show your power and give us rain. The day before, with all the preachers, with all the religious symbols, calling on God, no rain came. The little boy shows up the next day by himself in the square. And as he is praying, the sky grew darker. He was praying. As he was praying, rumbling started occurring. As he was praying, the showers hit. And as he was praying, the rain started pouring. Amen. So what was it about the little boy? He said the same things that all the people said the day before. The day before with all the preachers and all the ministers and all the people and all their religious symbols. But the day the young boy came, is when the rain came. Why? Because he showed up with his symbol, an umbrella. <laughs> an umbrella. Why? Because he came expecting right. rain. You know why our prayers seem so ineffective? They lack faith. They lack faith. The Roman centurion said, I know you have the authority. Say the word. Just say the word. Jesus said the word. 
because of his faith, his servant was healed. The woman said, if I can just but touch his garment. She wasn't looking for Jesus to touch her. She says, if I can just touch him. If I could get there. If I could get to Jesus. She touched him and what happened? She was healed immediately. Why? Jesus said, it's because of your faith. Jesus told Jairus, you want your daughter healed? Only believe. Have faith in it. Have the faith. He had the faith in his little girl was healed. So I ask you this morning, where's your faith this morning? Who's your faith in? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, please. I just want to ask you a couple of questions. I don't know you. You don't know me. 